you how important it is to take the wisdom behind a hadith into consideration and this is also what our fuqaha would do like we have dalatul ibil no? so we have the camels that run away like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said he said hold on to the quran yani revise it because it will escape you quicker than what than a camel which is let loose. When you, a camel is loose, it runs away. So now the Prophet ﷺ, he said, when you see a camel, leave it, don't touch it. Leave it, don't touch it. He said, because either it has a master who will find her, or a lord which will feed her, who will feed her. Yani a master who will find her, or a lord who will feed her. So in this context, when the Sahaba anhum were there, you will see that, you know, there was a lot of taqwa. So you could say, leave it, no problem. Yani, and people would listen. Now when we look, and I'm not going into the details, but if it evolved during the time of the Khulafa. So here it is very clear. The Prophet ﷺ saying, leave it alone. So now, when you come today, you would say, well, I'm going to leave it alone. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, leave it alone. So I'm not allowed to touch it. But then it went through two different stages where the first one of the, yani where, where uh, in the time of the Khulafa, the first one said, look, what we are going to do, now the camel, people are hungry, they are slaughtering these camels, they're eating them. So what we will do now is we will take the camel, we will put it aside, we will write down the description of the camel, the description of the camel, and when the master comes back, now when the master come back, comes back, we ask him to describe his camel, and if his description is right, we, we return the camel to him. But then later on, the Muslims were going through quite some difficult times. So they said, now keeping a camel, if there are many camels, keeping a camel is very costly. We need to feed the camel, we need to take care of the camel, so now what we are going to do, we will immediately when we have the camel, Nam, we will either sell it and keep the money and hold it, this money together with the description of the camel. And when the master comes back and he gives us the description of the camel, we give him the money. Or we slaughter it and give the money, whatever it may be that the money or the, the financial strength of uh, Beit al-Mal at that particular instance was. What? Straight away. Straight away, yes. Because it, it costs, right? It's not, it's, not, it's not for free. You need people to get, you know, the, the whatever the camel eats and so, so much forth. So now th this was all in the time of the Khulafa. This was all in the time of the Khulafa. So actually the Hadith, let the camel alone, turned into slaughter the camel. So here people now, this is their understanding. This is when you look at a hadith without fiqh. But not just anybody can do this. Because we are not maqasidiyun. People who just look at, the, you know, the goal and not at the means, the legit means that lead to that goal. And sometimes you can get to a goal through legit means and sometimes through means which are just imaginary. So only the fuqaha can do this. Not just put people looking at the maqsa. This is something what people today do a lot. They say, yeah, but because of the goals, you know, the, 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 the means are legit. Nam? Or because of the needs of people, I think we should say that now it's allowed. This is not what we do. Haram and halal are hukum shar'i that are, that, that what? That are based on kitab and sunnah. So anyway, is that understood here? So we have dalatul ibal, our fuqaha, instead of saying leave it alone, they said, Take the camel, slaughter it. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't speak without a reason. He looks at the, the, the state people are in, like Umar ibn Khattab anhu, when he comes down to Talaq al thalath and so forth, you see that the people were taking into consideration the taqwa, the God-fearingness of people or the absence of it in their fatawa, and the goal of what the Prophet ﷺ was saying, he was not saying, yani, leave the camel alone. He was saying, well, I'm not worried about the master losing his camel. 
But the moment that the fear for losing the camel, yani that the master won't find his camel is there, then the hukum changes. Yani then what? Then, then the rule will change. So this is where people look at the illa, yani where people look at the very reason of the hadith, which is not invented because it's within what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Because he said, because it has an owner that will find her. So if we now know that the owner will most likely not find her, the rule changes. Is that clear? Okay. So now this is also a reason why some fuqaha might not put a hadith into practice. Because the very reason why it was said is not present. And maybe the doing it will co uh, by doing it we will go against the reason why the Prophet وسلم, said it. Do you understand what I mean? So by putting it into practice we are actually disrespecting the advice of the Prophet وسلم, and reading his words as if they had no wisdom behind them. And we believe in the wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad Okay. Another reason might be differentiating between the Sunnah Al-Ada and the Sunnah Al-Ibadah. So this is another thing we need to look at. Like Sunnah Adiya and Sunnah Ta'abudiya or Sunnah Al-Ibadah. Meaning some of the things which the Prophet Sallallahu said or did were just things that were, how do you say Ada? Were habitual. They didn't have to do anything with, with what? With the tashri'a. And other things which he would do, sallallahu alayhi wa would have to do immediately with the shara, the, 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 that, that were the rules that were being established. So now, if we are going to look at this here, barakallahu fikum, you will see that the scholars very often, when something looks like ada, like something habitual, that they won't be as harsh on doing or not doing it than when it has to do with the ibadah. What do I mean? Sunnah ada is, for example, the Prophet ﷺ had his hair sometimes until his shoulders. It was on his shoulders. The Prophet ﷺ would sometimes have in his, on, uh, in his hair four dreads. Now, the Prophet ﷺ would have this. This is the way that he's described ﷺ in the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi. So now, today, if I were to come like that, this might be strange. Strange to you, like putting kohal in my eyes. The Prophet ﷺ would wear kohal in his eyes. Three in the right, three in the left. Which would look now today for me, not for the Prophet ﷺ, for me, like me wearing eyeliner. Even if today this is quite normal, but within our midst this is quite strange. So now, without mentioning that the kohal of the Prophet ﷺ was actually ithmid, and ithmid is brown, not black, and Ithmid, the Prophet ﷺ said, wear Ithmid because it's good for your sight and it makes your eyelashes grow. Nam, the Ithmid is brown. When you put it on, you don't see it. It accentuates the whiteness of your eyes. But it doesn't give away that you put something in your eyes. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ was wearing Ithmid. Anyway, so let's say Kohol. So now, this has to do with Urf. Like the Prophet ﷺ saying, use Ithmid. Is this for the tashri'a or is this an advice which has to do with habitual things or with tib, with medicine? So as you see, definitely the ifmid is not on its own ibadah. It's an advice of the Prophet ﷺ to, for people to what? To take care of their eyesight. Being it with ifmid or being it with something else. Is that clear? Okay. So now people would look at in the same way at, for example, the isbal. Like the Prophet ﷺ saying, like, don't wear your clothes under your ankles. Because that which is under your ankles is for hell. Mm. How are we going to understand this hadith today? One, does it have to do, essentially, did it have to do with ibadah or did it have to do with ada? That's the question I'm asking you. Like, is it more something habitual or is it more something... Worshipful. What do you think? Uh, just one? <laughs> because of the wording. Okay. So, I want you for next time, I'm not going to answer this, I want you to have a look at Al-Isbal and what our scholars said about it.
Okay? So isbel means that you wear your clothes under your ankles, or it can be also in your turban, or it can also be in your sleeves. That your sleeves are very long, your turban is very, very long, or what? Or your lower garment is very long. I want you for next week to look up what the scholar said about it, the different ahadith, and I want you to, to come to a conclusion and tell me why this is your conclusion. Can we do that? That's just homework number one. Homework number two, as we are all free thinkers who can make their own deen, I want you without using a fiqh text. You are not allowed to go to a fiqh text. I want you to tell me all the things which invalidate the wudu, wudu by using hadith books, not fiqh books, and tell me why. This is homework, so that means I, I'm, I will be waiting for this. And then the last thing, you have two weeks, so that's sufficiently long. I want you f to tell me which elements in your prayer are obligatory and which ones are rec recommended without using fiqh books. Do this for next week. If you come to me and, and you really, you, <laughs> and you impress me, I will follow your madhab. <laughs> No, no, not to try. Try uh, people today uh, yani say that it's easy, so let us do it <laughs> if that's easy. Okay. Anyway, so our hour and a half is gone. Subhanallah. Um, so, uh, excuse me. You already forgot. <laughs> the first one was what was about isbel. The second one was that which breaks your wudu. And the third one is that which is obligatory in your prayer and that which is merely recommended in your prayer. And what are you not allowed to do? Don't use any fiqh book. And believe me, if you use fiqh books, I will see it. Even if you don't. I would say, you are looking in a Malik fiqh book, brother. <laughs> you are looking in a Shafi'i one. So come and give it to me. And like, make it very nice, your research. Excuse me? <laughs> okay, or, or you can just say, I'm not going to look into fiqh books, I know for myself. But then, watch out. <laughs> yes, I also need to know in which collection of hadith did you find it? Where did you look? Why do you think that the hadith is authentic? Or Hassan? Why? Why do you think that this hadith is stronger than that one? Maybe it goes back to the narrators. Maybe it goes back to something else. Tell me. Because we are going to make our own fiqh from today. That's sarcasm, by the way. Yeah. Okay, that's it for me. So, alhamdulillah, if you take one, one thing away, barakallahu fikum, uh, people say that with regards to these things, I'm very harsh or very strict. But I believe that we have to be. Because our, our deen is either bringing us to Ridallah wa Jannati, to the contentment of Allah in His paradise, or either ila ghadabihi wa nari, or to His anger and His hellfire. This is what deen is about. And if you say something about the deen which is not correct, you are a liar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not say with your tongues, Yani, don't say with your tongues, this is halal and that is haram, because eventually you will be lying about Allah. And those who lie about Allah will not prosper, not in this life and not in the hereafter. So halal and haram yani, is holy. Because it's based on two holy things. I mean that we hold high. Which is kalamullah wa kalamu rasulihi. And the last thing is, fiqh is not derived from one hadith. Your dalil is the result of the adilla, which is our fiqh books, void of any hadith. Void of any ayah. Because if they were to tell us where they got it from, we wouldn't even understand one sentence. 
We wouldn't. عام خاص مطلق مقيد مبين. Then go to the usul of the ahnaf. Go to the manar. يا ربي. It's all about language and majaz and kinay and this. What are we going to do? So this, trust your ulama, read the fiqh book, and not before you finish your homework, read the fiqh book and just put it into practice without even doubting. Haftu ma'nina. The people of our ummah have been doing this for 1,200 years. And 200 years ago, some people that yani, were in Pakistan and India invented new scholars in Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan and other places around the world. And then we just lost track of our deen. And so today people don't know whether they're divorced or married. They don't know. They don't know whether their income is halal or haram. They don't know whether this contract is correct or incorrect. So in their lives, they might be praying and praying, but they don't see a spiritual change. You know why? Because any spirituality which is not accompanied by fiqh will not help you. Because fiqh will stop you from, ha from harming others and from being harmed by others. And that's the true zuhud. So I finish with the words of Muhammad al-Shaybani, rahmatullahi alayhi, Muhammad al-Shaybani, student of Abu Hanifa, narrator of the Muwatta of Imam Malik, the teacher of Imam Shafi'i, who was the teacher of Imam Ahmed. I finish with his words when he was asked, why didn't you write a book about ascetism, and about zuhud, and distancing yourself from, from dunya? He said, I have. The moment I wrote a book about financial transactions. Now I have. Fiqh is for me the true form of tasawwuf. It is the true form of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when you are living fiqh, there is no haram in your life. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa habibina wa qudwatina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. I also would like to thank uh, Ustaz Salih Ani who came up with the idea to do this, uh, who had, um, yani, who made time as well, Karima Foundation, Barakallahu Fikum as well, and everybody pre being present. My wife as well for accompanying me, uh, Yani, for the long drive. And I want to finish with her words when she said, if people, uh, and subhanAllah, I always take this to my classes. She said, if people without knowledge would have remained silent, the deen of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have been as clear today as it was the day he left the face of the earth. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ala Sallam, Muhammad Wa Ala Ali Wa Sallam. Yes, we have. Questions? I'm going to sit here, inshallah. Yes. Bismillah. Sorry, Sidi. Uh, when you mentioned the hadith for Kamal, yes. you were saying it was beneficial. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hair, you mentioned Uf. Mm -hmm. Am I just seeing the um, benefit and the um, Ijma? Are you talking about that or are you just talking about Uf? What is customary? I, I don't understand your question. That in the Hanafis, mm. they have the Psalm, yes. and the Malikis, they have um, Ijma on what's in Medina. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're talking about those two examples, we use the word, this is beneficial. Uh, they didn't have to feed the people, so uh, the camels, so they slaughtered them. Mm -hmm. Was that of benefit? We, we will discuss this when we get to the Amal of, of the people of Medina, which is uh, within the slides. We're going to talk about that. What the amal, because we actually also have the amal of the people of Kufa, by the way, yeah. up to a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah, so what would you say, um, Excuse me? What would you say, because um, there's a famous scholar in England, I heard it in my own ears. Mm -hmm. He's from a Hanafi background, and uh, he said, This is Hulu thick, you don't need it. You only need this Quran and Sunnah and a bit of Qiyas. Yes, yeah, salam. And the thing is, people, obviously, the average person just has trust, you know, because we. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna, you're, you're giving long, well, we give complicated arguments that they, they deem as philosophy, but then they're obviously having a basic level of trust with people. Yes. So oh. what, what can you do in that scenario, really, when somebody's saying, and then obviously what I noticed personally myself, mm. when I was on a hajj, somebody, an issue came up about using toothpaste, which was flavored. Yes. And I can't remember what the ruling was. Mm. No, it was something to do with perfume, and then when somebody I was with who didn't really follow money, he said, well, so what? I can do, if I can do X, Y, Z, which has a, use a toothpaste, therefore that means I can do this. And you think his own... Yes. The thing is, that's Hajj, you paid a lot of money, but the thing is, it, it wasn't really... And they're the good people, they're you know, religious, praying, get up for Hajar, 
so it's that kind of mindset. I don't know. It's uh, what, what would you, how, how would you deal with that, really? I think, Ustad Saleh, what is necessary today is that people with knowledge or students of knowledge, that they do what you are actually doing here, which I am a part of, um, like talking about these matters and showing how complicated it is to study the deen, not to live the deen. And I think by teaching usul, by reviving, you know, the, the, the teaching the usul of the madhab, the usul al-fiqh, the qawaid al-fiqh, the rasm al-mufti, by giving these examples that people will take away that deen coming to conclusions is not for you. For you. I don't mean for you. I mean for you. And I think it's through teaching. It's really through teaching. But to say the Quran and Sunnah just do qiyas, I don't know one of the brothers that I, that, you know, approach Quran and Sunnah like this, if, if you just ask them, give the, what's the, the, the sarf and the nahu of Qul Allahu Ahad, they just don't know. So how are, don't you need Arabic, for example, to start with just qiyas, your aql? So anyway, I think reviving, as we are doing, is, is the best way to do this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whom he wants. And also by differentiating between fuqaha and wa'ad. By differentiating what we do now, we always give titles to people. Like somebody studying three years, you're a mufti, you're a qadi, you're a sheikh, you're a qari, you're an imam, you're a this. And these state, giving these titles should be given very carefully. Because when we start calling everybody sheikh, now everybody who talks about deen is sheikh. Sometimes the biggest sheikh are not known about amongst people, but when you have a lot of followers, you're a sheikh. So people forget there's a difference. That might be a wa'ith, which is important. Changing the hearts of people, but that doesn't qualify that person to give verdicts. That this doesn't qualify this person to give you guidance in fiqh and fatawa. So I think giving titles is one of the most important things to do. You need to correctly and maybe create an organization, whatever, where people with knowledge give the titles that people do deserve. So that not everybody is just, you know, 50 or 100 years ago in Morocco, Ustad Salif, if someone would talk about religion, you know, without ha having studied, they would just take him to the Qadi. Say, this man is talking about religion without knowledge. So I think reviving, Allah, I don't know if this is to be your question, but anyway, I revive knowledge, revive giving the, the correct titles to the correct people, inspiring people with fear to talk about knowledge without knowledge, and so much more. I think it's a very big job today. People just don't want to listen. No. See, we also have our ancestors, the Salaf. We don't, we're not really aware of them, like say, you know, to say uh, you know some of the Sahaba, oh. Salim, mm -hmm. you know, Zubair, mm -hmm. The grandchildren, we're not really aware of them and the big roles that they played and who they are. Mm -hmm. So that connection, mm -hmm. so we know who Batman is, <coughs> Spider-Man, mm -hmm. and these names have been lost. Mm -hmm. So I don't know um, if we need to talk about them more. What do you mean, about their fiqh or about their lives? About their life, and maybe, I don't know about the fiqh, because obviously mm -hmm. we already got the pick here by talking about that pick, you might just, I don't know, but especially about the lights, we should celebrate them, who they were, how important they were, mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes people don't know these names, and uh, they yeah. are the people who are the narrators of the hadith mm -hmm. as well. And the book, uh -huh. my, my question is kind of related to that, in that what work um, has been done and is available around the uh, characters of individual narrators and I suppose where I'm coming from is something that I've been recently they were denigrating the character of Abu Hurairah yes and, on, mm -hmm. and you know, I have no idea how I can um, establish that he's trustworthy memory all those kinds of things mm -hmm. well this is usually a, a, a doubt which is inspired by the Shia themselves uh, to I'm not saying this person is Shia you that's not a trust a Quranist okay yeah, yeah because they want to yeah, they, 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 anyway, so one of the things they base themselves on is, is narration in Bukhari where the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ask Abu Huray radiallahu anhu, how comes that you narrate that which we do not narrate? Well, they turn it into a negative. Like if, if I give an intonation, look at me now. The Abu Huraira, how, how come you narrate what we didn't narrate? Like, the Abu Huraira, how did you narrate which we didn't narrate? Do you see what's happening? Now, I can turn it by 
the intonation of my voice into something positive that they were astonished, like Allahu Akbar, and I can turn it into a negative, like they were doubting him. And if we then look, well, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, and he was trusted by the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam taught him to not to perform witr after sleeping, but to pray witr before sleeping. And one of the reasons was because he was memorizing the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa yani during three or four years. In three or four years, he became the biggest narrator. And when they asked him, how, why do you narrate what we don't narrate? He said, when he was hungry, I was hungry with him. When he was going through the streets at night to check on people, I was walking with him. When you were occupied in the souk, I was occupied listening to his words. So he explained how he in such a small period of time. And don't forget the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. So if the Prophet ﷺ makes dua for Abu Huraira, I mean it's done. Like he made dua for Abdullah ibn Abbas as well, and to, to teach him ta'wil al-Qur'an. So if we now look at everything, then we know that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, at night, the first third of the night, he would just spend revising all the hadith he had memorized, and then he would perform his witr, and then he would pray. So and this, and this is why he became the biggest narrator, so we don't doubt him. And the thing is, if you doubt the Sahaba, you doubt the Sunnah, but then you should also doubt the Qur'an. And this is what eventually, like also today, a lot of people, they, 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 they speak about Bukhari, they speak about the Sunnah. Eventually, and I told this to my wife as well, there will come a moment in time where they will spread doubts about the Qur'an in the name of Islam. That will come. And then we've lost our Wahyain. Then we've lost the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So we have to be firm in our belief of the Sahaba. Why? عنهم, because they are the bridge between Qur'an and Sunnah. If, if we lose our trust in them, well, let's lose our, let's us, let us lose our trust in Deen. Uh, thank you. But more generally, yeah. um, how, how can one um, be confident in that particular writer? Possibly? Our scholars, they have uh, written books uh, and the, there's a science which is called the Jahwa Ta'adil and Ilm al-Rijal. So where the, the scholars, they have written down the accuracy and the trustworthiness of people. And it's, it's not something simple, like I'm explaining this. It's a knowledge. Uh, I, I will let you ask a question straight away. Uh, so it's, it's a separate science with its proper terminology and proper scholars where people yani, know when someone entered the town, when someone left the town, in which year, which month, so that when he says, I heard the sheikh say, they say it's impossible, because when he, that sheikh came into Baghdad, the other one was in Dimashq. Because people, they were protecting the deen and know that the sunnah is protected as well. It's not just the Qur'an. The Qur'an, the wahyain are protected. And this is what a lot of people forget, because when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have revealed the Qur'an and we will protect it. It's also by protecting the Sunnah. If you understand what I mean. Yeah. It's by protecting the Sunnah as well. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, we have revealed the Qur'an upon you so that you would explain to people what has been revealed upon them. In how is he explaining? Well, that's the Sunnah. So if Allah says that the Wahi is preserved and the explanation should then also be reserved. So if we doubt that, and I'm not saying you do, then we all once again doubt the deen. So everything is so accurately written. Maybe, maybe it's good if we talk about Jahl al later. You, you, you know, it, you will be amazed how accurate these people were. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Jazakum Jazakum khairan, everybody. Um, so we will see when we get back together. It's...